Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Tim Kell of T. Kell Knives. T. Kell Knives caught my eye a few years back and had an immediate impact due to three different distinct reasons. The knives themselves are hard use, obviously, combat and self-defense oriented, and they're made by a Marine Corps veteran in the United States. And that man, Tim Kell, has a big personality. If you've ever seen Tim's shop or product videos on Instagram, you'll know what I mean. Uh, but beyond that, word began seeping in from the field and from collectors that Tim's knives are both rough and ready for hell, but feel like a dream in the hand and in use. Also, I have it on good word that the man makes killer biscuits. Uh, just another testament to his craftsmanship. We'll get into all of that in a moment, but first be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and share the show. You can also download the show to your favorite podcast app to listen on the go. And as always, if you'd like to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkie's merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. Tim, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, thanks, man. It's good to have you. Uh, as I mentioned up front, you are a, a U.S. Marine Corps veteran, so I, I have to thank you for your service uh, in in uh, serving this country, and also I take it as my family. Uh, I take it personally, so thank you very much. I appreciate well, you're that. You're welcome. Yeah. It was my honor. Well, okay, so... As I mentioned up front, your knives, TKL knives, they are definitely um, oriented towards hard use, towards combat, towards self-defense. And those are the things, uh, those are where my knife tastes really uh, run. So so the work that you do really did catch my eye uh, immediately. And then I saw something, an audacious design, which I just happened to have in front of me. And that really, uh, man, that sealed the deal for me, this Guardian. I'm a big Warncliffe guy. And the fact that it's triple edged just really got me reeling. So uh, I think you design knives in a way that people maybe aren't expecting. Um, yeah. How did how did you get started with this? What what was the impetus to push you into knife making? It's kind of weird. Uh, well, I'm weird, so that helps to do weird <laughs> stuff as a weird person. I, I worked for the railroad, and I got furloughed. I did a job in signal maintenance, which is an electrical type of job, and that's my craft. And I was kind of bored collecting some railroad retirement and had always built and made my own things, firearms. I had a forge from doing that. I like sharp stuff. I like stabby things. So that was kind of the first foray into, actually, my wife told me, she said, hey, you know what? I saw this show on TV and you could do that. And I was like, really? What is it? And it was forged in no, fire. Iron. iron and fire. Actually, it was predates forged in fire. So I made a kitchen knife because... I'm smart and I'm like, well, if I'm going to have a new hobby, it better be a gift for my wife. So that's what I did. And she's like, this is actually pretty good. So I just started making stuff the way I liked it. And we were selling at some local places and people really, really liked them. And I started making stuff for me. And it, this whole thing just kind of took off into what it is today. And I, my approach is completely different. Uh, how would you say it's different? Well, I, I wasn't a knife guy first. I, I was, I'm a combatant and I'm a firearms guy and some martial arts background and some military background. And I'm an avid shooter and a family protector. And I couldn't find a fixed blade that would pair well with that. And, and I had broken so many folding knives and I've always liked knives. So I didn't really trust them for what I wanted to do. And I'm a worker. So I'm a blue collar kind of guy. And I wanted stuff that would hold up to my stupidity and my marineness, but I wanted comfortable and not something that's just really ostentatious, this big, huge sword on my side. And I couldn't find that. 
anywhere. So uh, you mentioned your marineness and and uh, having a lot of uh, family who are in the Marine Corps and such. I, I think I know what you mean, but what was your experience in the Marine Corps with knives, knife usage, the knives that you were issued, and then how they ended up performing? Oh, without saying names, everybody knows what blade the Marine Corps typically issued. It was a 1095 steel blade. And we were taught combatives with those things, but because most Marines eat crayons, we didn't know that you weren't supposed to dig with it and pry open crates and stab desert rats and MREs and all that stuff. And I always liked that blade because they gave it to me, but I always had thoughts of, you know, if I did it myself, I would do it this way with no intention of ever actually doing that. Right, right. But but you found the tool itself, and we all know you're talking about K-Bar, and we all love K-Bar, so it's no skin off of their back. <laughs> but but um, did you feel like it was uh, kind of substandard for the sort of use uh, that you were actually putting it to use? You know, it's a combat knife. It's a Bowie blade. Oftentimes the swedge, at least in the old days, was sharpened, meant for knife fighting. But it, it, it seems in the modern era, era that happens, you know, vanishingly. Uh, yeah. less than in the old days. I didn't like the grip and the guard. I, I just didn't like them. They didn't seem intuitive to me. And that's where all the ergonomics comes with my stuff. I wanted balance. I didn't find it very well balanced. It was robust. I mean, we beat the hell out of that thing. But, and you could sharpen on a river rock. That's why my first steel I tried was 1095 because I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I moved beyond that because I wanted more for my blades. But I just didn't like it. I mean, the sheath was terrible. I just, hmm. I mean, okay. we have a low budget. You were talking about, yeah, that's right. In the Marine, you get all the, the Marines, you get all the cast yeah, the like the, stuff, like the Cobra, the Huey Cobra, while, while the army is flying around in their, in their, what is it? Uh, whatever their attack chopper is. Uh, anyway, uh, I think it's cool because the Marines make good use of, of older, equipment and it that just shows that it's the mind and not necessarily the tool yeah uh, that improvise that, adapt and overcome you hear about right 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 they give us garbage so you know if you're, gonna, if you're gonna be the most effective fighting force in the country and they give you a trash bag to go fight with you but that <laughs> <laughs> work so you're talking about the ergonomics of the k-bar and i i agree with you that it's kind of round handled it could turn in your hand where did your love or your appreciation for those ergonomics come from on K bars? No, on your on knives. Mine, because I, I want, I love indexable things. So a lot of times you're in the dark and you don't know. So I wanted it easily to be able to have that narrow grip that you absolutely know where cut foot goes this way, point points that way, sharp stuff, not you. That so that's what did it for me was I wanted narrow, but I also wanted something that when it meets your hand you absolutely know it's there so i really minimized my grip and completely didn't do what anybody else was doing because i didn't know any better so i spent a lot of time perfecting a knife that actually fits into the shape of your hand rather than having to overcompensate with a super fat handle um, I was reading your bio on your webpage, and and you mentioned your father um, and how he gifted you. He made a tradition of gifting you a knife every Christmas. Uh, that's yeah. a tradition we have in in my family. Um, I give everyone who will accept one a knife at Christmas, and um, I I was really touched by that story, especially the the part where you talk about how. Um, when he decided to make you a knife, he gave you something to mold your grip in. Exactly. He wanted to make something for your hand. Uh, tell me how that influenced uh, your design. And I didn't realize that it had until years later. But he he worked for Delta Airlines, and they had all these space stage materials. And I, he literally had me squeeze it into my hand to where it was a comfortable grip. And he did the lost wax process, and he made this grip. And... It was always something that I saw him make his own tools and he built firearms and blades and he always, I'd see him, he'd grab it, he'd feel it, or he'd move something and really detailed in all of his work to make it match what he was trying to do. Hmm. And I guess his influence on me in everything that I did came out later in my designs. And then when I stumbled upon 
after I had already started making blades, and that's, that may be part of the story you're referencing. Yeah. I found that knife, and it was just like this lightning bolt moment. Like, this is what I'm supposed to do. It was very moving because the way I lost my father was very traumatic for me, and I never really accessed that. And in that moment, you know, it wasn't like a weeping, oh, my gosh, I'm going to kill myself kind of thing, but I just was like, man, I can honor him by kind of picking up that torch and moving it forward and make something that he would want, that he would be proud of. So that really just kind of pushed me into that, you know, he never really cared what other people were doing anyway. And I always admired that about him. He was a very respectful person. He was very genuine. And I kind of modeled my life after that. And then my design followed that. So he's just, he's a piece of every single blade. I, I love um, family stories in, in these knife interviews I do. And there are a lot of them where people yeah. turn their knife business into a family business. And I love that. And in your case, um, I, I get that sense, but it also basically traces back to before the company even began. Um, yeah. it's, it's as if your father's a part of the company um, because of that influence. I think that that is, uh, you know, that is a strong foundation. It is. And, you know, that was more than half of my life ago that 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 happened. And it's it's yesterday. It's still yesterday to me. So you and mentioned uh, I'm sorry, I, I just interrupted you. Um, you've mentioned before when we spoke on the phone, you just said it right now uh, that part of your design strength um, and you look at your knives, you have a large catalog of designs. And they they're all very uh, confident designs, but different. You know, they yeah. they look the same, but different. And that's uh, that's uh, a recurring theme. Also, the same, but different. But the fact that you don't know any better, quote unquote, yeah, uh, is a strength. How do you think that that's a strength? I think a lot of what I see in the industry and, and I'm kind of on the fringe of the industry. I don't know a lot of people in the industry. And that, that's not necessarily by choice. That's just how it how it happened. I, I did my own thing and I didn't have to ask a lot of people, well, how do you make a handle? Well, how, what do you put on your blade? What is that material? And, and how do you make a kydex sheath? Without going into too many gory details, initially I reached out to some people when a lot of people were telling me, Hey, your stuff's really different. And they didn't want to help. And that, so here I am, like, I, th I think I'm good at this. I, I really study material and metal and function and form, but I can't get anybody to even teach me what goes on a knife handle. So I just used my background in other industries that I came from and just made it how I thought it should be done. And it ended up being a hole in the market. It's It's been the craziest thing. I don't take all this credit like, wow, I'm the greatest knife designer. Please touch my robe. That's just not how I am, but <laughs> it's become its own thing. And it blows my mind. People will see a picture of a new knife and go, I knew that was a TKL before I saw your name on it. You know, uh, this coming from different industries is a, is a big, uh, leads to a lot of innovation in the knife world. I know Ernie Emerson was uh, actually right. a lot of people were in um, uh, aerospace engineering uh, in California and other places, but aerospace engineering is a big uh, place where a lot of uh, knife led from and other industries. And I think uh, you're, uh, you're one of those, you, know, you can count yourself among those innovators because being at it uh, from a lifelong, um, you know, n nerd, uh, a lifelong immersion in knife and knife design. It's more how to get, how to, how to make the ultimate tool and how to get that yeah. job, you know, done. Um, uh, here's, here's your guardian. Uh, here's my guardian, I should say. Right. Uh, you thank you now. very much. Yeah, hey, this, this is, is a beauty. Well, I, I put it half on there. Uh, you have, you sell these aftermarket handles to fit your knives right. to, to put the, the karambit style ring on there, uh, can be used as a knife pull, or you can use it as a karambit. Um, me, I like it as a, an extended handle, right. uh, in this grip. Um, but I left the beautiful black hawk. Whoops. I left this side on. I love that purple and black. We're going to do those 
in all the different colors coming up, it's, it is incredibly hard to get that height just right, to get oh, the I, black on top or the purple on top. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, but I'm going to get to this blade. I want to talk about this blade because this was the first, um, this was an early model of yours, I think. And yeah. and I, and it really, uh, one of my friends, um, Dave of This Old Sword Blade Reviews got one of Dave. these. And I was like, oh my God, what it... I love, as I said in the open, I love Warren Cliffs and I love anything with a double edge. I'm a, I just, that's just my thing. And, and when I saw a triple edged Warren Cliff, it, it made me, um, you know, it made me real. And, and then you posted something recently on Instagram with some of your, uh, I think they're the nightshades, uh, the yeah. small self-defense knives, and they have shallow bevels. When you look at it, you're right. like, wow, that's a, that's a thick blade and a shallow bevel. And, and you make a point and I, I, I loved this. And actually I've quoted you a couple of times uh, in, you know, in the videos I've made of this knife, which are only a couple of shorts uh, so far, but I mentioned how you say these are not for cutting paper. These are not right. for shaving arm hair or slicing cheese. These are for what do you, you, you tell me. I mean, it's for creating a deep, wide, difficult to close wound track. There's not a romantic way to say that. It's just not, I mean, I guess Amazon has some boxes that need, have really thick tape and you just really need to get in there, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I just, a pressure cut, and you're a martial artist as well. You understand that. And I've got a video coming out. I'll have to ask my wife when that's coming. We shot the B-roll for that. And the Guardian is center stage with a traditional pork man, so pork tenderloin. And, I mean, it's just – it takes nothing. And I have to say that in email. So, hey, I got this Guardian. And I'm like, I know you didn't read the description. I already know when I see the title of the email that it didn't shave hair, which, by the way, is a terrible test of sharpness anyway. But it, it just – you touch it, and it, it, it just pops open. I mean – it's super sharp, but it's not slicey sharp. And if yes. it's in a get up off of me, it's nasty. You know, so, I mean, it's. I'm sorry, uh, I'm interrupting you again, but this is what is really pleasing to me because there are so few people out there who are willing to call a spade a spade and say, look, this is a knife for self-defense. And if you're gonna if you're gonna embrace that idea, you got to be able to say the word wound channel without, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. because that's what it's about. Just like, uh, you know, you could have a firearm for target practice. You could have a firearm for hunting or you could have a firearm for all of those plus self-defense. And when yeah. you have that, you have to consider the fact that it, it, it has an effect on the human body. And and the greater the effect, the more valuable it is as a, as a tool for that purpose. And so that that was one thing that just I really loved about that. It's refreshing. Uh, to hear that, but also, um, you know, I've I've been a knife nerd long enough to see trends come and go, and for a long time, it was the hard hard use uh, sharpened pry bar folder. Love them, I got a ton of them. Um, and then it became, oh no, no, it's all about thin and slicey. Aren't you just gonna? Don't you want to cut with it? And so I love that too. I have a lot of thin and slicey. Yeah, but but to, <laughs> to kind of those. to not pay attention to that and to make purpose-driven tools to me is is sort of the, uh, no matter uh, what the trend is, is the ultimate goal. Yeah. I mean, I've always been that guy that everybody knew and most everybody liked, I think, at least to my face. And I never, I didn't wear what was cool. I just wore what was comfortable. I mean, I was that kid working on cars and making them go super fast, listening to rock and roll in my garage with my dad. I didn't just, I just didn't do what they did, but everybody was cool with me. And that's in my knife design too. Like, I don't know what's cool in the industry. I just don't. And I made what I needed. And I found out that a lot of, we, I, I get this all the time. Thank you for making stuff like for guys like us. And I'm like, I didn't know that nobody was doing it. I didn't know. And I don't know that nobody's doing it. I just, that's what I hear a lot. So I'm just honored to, be different i guess is, is a, a good way to put it because i don't try to be different you know it just comes out that way 
So where does your design inspiration come from? I mean, I, I know I know it comes from making useful tools, but they're not just useful tools. They're also, forgive the term, pretty. They're they're beautiful knives, you know, to look at. The uh, you were just holding up your your newest, and I know it's all sold out. I already tried, <laughs> but the yeah, uh, I don't know. That's crazy. The Sapper, it, it's a beautiful knife, and I know that's a collaboration. I want to talk about collaborations down the road a bit, but but uh, where? How do you design your knives? I I tell. We have my I have my first employee now, and so that's cool. Uh, he he puts screws and stuff. But I was telling him just the other day, I love cars, and but I don't like cars in the way that some other people like. Kip Foos is such a great car designer, and my knives I, I like them to look sleek, and I want them to look like they're going towards injury. <laughs> I can't say that a different way. I told a guy yesterday. I said. You look at all my knives, they look like they're going to cut the S out of you just laying there on the table. And he's like, how do you do that? I was like, uh, I just take my pencil and I put it on the paper. Even the way I, my, they just look fast. I, I And even the bigger finger whales are like wheel whales to me. But like I said, I'm oh, such yeah. a strange dude. <laughs> just... No, no, no. I can see that. And I'm looking at the mercenary right now as Jim is scrolling by. And it does have a uh, a Corvette feel or an autom automotive feel uh, with the sort of forward leaning curves and that wheel uh, finger finger choil. And uh, and it and like I said before, they look pretty. But then but then you hold it in your hand and you see and you can feel uh, a that it's meant for a human hand. Yeah. And that there's no doubt which way it's oriented when it's in hand and yeah. that it's going to, you know, beg to go towards what it's intended that is, target that is. is. first for me. I didn't understand a lot of the fixed blades that I had. I would grab it and be like, okay, I, I know how to use a blade. I, I, I'm a worker and I have some training to use it for not work. Wink, wink. But this doesn't make sense to me. Why are they doing this? My hand is not shaped like an oval. I don't understand that. So I just, I mean, painstaking, little here, little there on the 2x72. Actually, I made my first 2x72 out of a freaking treadmill. But oh, nice. Yeah, there's an old video, and it's still out there. And I'm about 800 pounds heavier in that video, but it's in the other shop. It's still on a property. And skateboard wheels and motors and welded together because I'm a craftsman. So I, I just build stuff and I used it for years until it quit tracking right. This, uh, the grooves you put in the corners of not uh, the corners of the handles, not the corners, you know what I mean? Uh, right up here yeah. on these edges. Uh, they seem, when I first looked at them, I like, well, they, they all look the same. They all look kind of regularly spaced out. How are they going to fit different hands? And I have medium sized hands that uh you know big knives feel good in small knives feel good in and and everything lands just right in place uh tell me a little bit about how you go about making these handles because you offer a whole bunch of different materials as well like different looks you could yeah. have a cheerful looking t -Kel knife uh yeah. you know while you practice your wound track your <laughs> brachial cuts it can be pretty uh it was always important to me when I would work on anything that I didn't put something stupid on a knife that didn't make sense. So even like you were talking about the sapper, these are in different directions and they ended up looking aggressive, but they serve to pull you into that knife without creating a hot spot. So each one is placed that way. And I will grab a blade a million times. I know I look like a weirdo when I'm designing a knife, but I'm always, you know, grabbing it, moving my hand around and how we need to move this. We need to do that. And that's the grips are that way. I mean, and I don't want to polish G10. It may look cool, but this is actually that texture is a micro texture from a SIG hand grip because <laughs> that's comfortable and it's grippy. And when it's wet, I stay on my pistol or the, the, the grip on my any of my other rifles, I like that feel. So to me, we had to put it on. Um, well, okay. So tell me a little bit about how you go about making these. Uh, a little bit about your process. 
and and I got to say before we actually before we you get into that, it I find it very interesting that you said you had difficulty getting help from from people when you first started because I've heard a lot of the opposite. You know, so uh, well, I, yeah, great. yeah, that 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 people are very willing to help. Uh, that's what I've heard mostly. Um, so uh, it's interesting to hear a little bit of counterpoint to that. It sounds like a realistic thing to me. Um, yeah, uh, but, I mean. We probably don't want to go into super details, and I don't, no. I don't want to name drop, but no. I'm I'm kind of a direct guy. I feel like I'm a super nice human, but I I can ask a question like, "Well, why are you doing that?" And some people think that that's that's an assault, or uh, it's genuinely not. I'm very studious. I study a lot of stuff. I read a lot. I I. And that may have been why they're like, oh, I will piss off. Uh, but they're like, yeah, I'll call you right back. And then, uh, you know, but I don't know if that was it or I asked too many questions that didn't make sense to what everybody else. I don't know. I don't know. I tried it twice with two different people and I was like, OK, I guess I'm going to have to figure this out on my own. Well, so then what did you figure out? Tell me a little bit about how you make these knives, what your process is. And also, where's your? tell me about your shop, too. I want to hear about this. The shop is just behind this wall. <laughs> if, you, nice. if you look outside the door, I've got a couple thousand blades hanging on the wall. It's at home. So in the basement, and we started in a, another shop on the property, and it got, well, one, I didn't know anything about ventilation. So I'm out there, and I started out with a forge, propane forge. And I was getting a little woozy and I, I was like, man, I need to do something different. So I look it up. Why did I feel like crap after a the night for three hours? Oh yeah. Carbon dioxide, that stuff will kill you. So then I was like, well, let me go with an electric oven, built an electric oven and it just grew. And I literally was freezing my hind end off. And my wife felt so bad for me. She's like, just move your shop in the basement. So that's where it is now. And, but we've grown to the point I had this, uh, a CNC machine. I bought one because I went to a guy and said, I'm getting killed. I make six knives a week and people want 12. And he's like, well, you should do CNC stuff. And I'm like, what is that? So I look into it. He's like, oh yeah, you can easily do it. So I, they said it was going to cost me $45 to per blade. And I'm like, these things are 80 bucks. I can't do that. You know, I just didn't feel like I didn't know that people would pay money for good stuff. I always did, but I was I didn't know. So I uh, I bought a CNC machine, not knowing what in the hell I was doing. Three days later, it shows up in my driveway, and I called that guy back because he had told me, if you're serious, you'll buy a CNC machine. So I call him. I said, I don't know if you remember me, but um, you told me about making knives and uh, there's a CNC machine in my driveway. Can you help me put it together? And he goes, are you effing serious? And I was like, yeah. He goes, what's your name again? And I was like, Tim Kelly. He's like, "Where?" I guess that dude works for me full time now. <laughs> full time. Awesome. And we built him a shop last year because so he sits in his shop and it's actually we did it over the state line because I'm just on the Tennessee, Georgia border. Mm. So it's cheaper for me to pay the bills in Tennessee than it is there. So he sits in his happy little room and that's partially because I'm always coming up with new knife designs. And if he were in the shop, he'd be like, shut up, no more new knives today. Let me make this one. So I just, to, that's how that, that process started me being insane going, sure. Okay. I'll do that. And I, I didn't have the money to buy a CNC, but I did. So the CNC, is it is it doing, um, are you making blades and handles with it? I know a lot of people just make handles or some people just well, we do the blades. we started out with just blades and literally camera wife, as she's known to everyone in the world, she would come in the shop and flip the blades over and let them do the other side. And I mean, I was anal about, no, this has to look and feel and move exactly like this hand ground one. I would take the hand ground one like, all right smarter than me guy make this on your magic machine because i'm not doing it that way i'll hand grind the crap and i'll go out of business i'm not i'm not i'm not manufacturing these blades so she would go flip the things over and the only reason that she got moved out of my shop is she got tired of getting the stupid little metal chips in her fingers and me tracking them upstairs in the house 
Uh, yeah, it's got your friend, Mr. CNC, his ass is out of here. <laughs> so I called that guy who taught me how to do it. And I said, Hey man, got a CNC machine for sale. And he goes, Hey, you know, we could put that in my basement. And I'm like, we could. And then that's now a, he's got a couple more. That's a fantastic idea, sir. Let's make and this the, work. And now machine and G10, you asked about that. We tried that and that's another one of those don't suck carbon monoxide. Don't eat G10, kids, because mm -hmm. it gives you a gravelly voice. You may sound like a tough guy, but it's not good to eat that stuff. I quickly realized that I don't need to. Well, they were all handmade. And again, that anal super, super detail, it's got to be just like this. I couldn't find anybody to do that. And then I found one guy smarter than me, and he helped me get the grip design down. And he already had figured out the ventilation and how to cut G10. So I was like, well, I'm buying my G10 from this place. They make it in America. So will you do your magic? And so we did both initially on one CNC. But our trajectory has been like this. I mean, it's just really quick. Yeah. And I'm, I'm funny about other people doing my stuff. Well, this is like you being them. it's like you being a producer uh, where you're you're starting to automate your your process and ha and bring in the best people for the job to do certain parts of the job. Yeah. And and that's what's uh, the, I mean, uh, to me, that seems like that's what's making that trajectory go up is that you, you've streamlined the process. And now uh, I'm interested, though, you were talking about how you design knives. You take your pencil, you put it on the paper and you design a knife. Uh, does the CNC, has the CNC process changed any of that for you? No, no. I don't have a working knowledge of being a machinist. And I think that's partially why it's good that he's in his own shop because I don't design the knife around how easy it is to machine. So we've, we and he have come up with ways to make them exactly the way I designed them. And he, he's, if he dies, I'm completely screwed because <laughs> we're doing it a different way. And he's told me that. I'm like, can you teach somebody? He's like, I can't. He's like, I can't even teach you. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. I mean, what are we doing different? Because I'm not telling you that because you talk too much. <laughs> I'm like, all right. I mean, <laughs> but it, it, if, if I want this angle lean forward because it looks aggressive and I, and he's like, well, we can't do that. And I'm like, well, you told me, smart guy, that your super smart machine can do what these hands can do. And here's the hand ground one. So, uh, well, you just it's talk cheap and it kind of ticks him off a little. But it, he called me Steve Jobs. <laughs> he said, you have these impossible things and this can't be done. I'm like, but you always do it. And he's like, I probably should stop doing that because it encourages you to be a madman. That's and good. It worked. I mean, uh, you, you got to push people. You got to push people, you know, I because push many, I mean, I don't stop, you know. It's well, like you a, won't, you only feel that when it's your thing, even if, even if this gentleman is like heavily invested and loves you and loves the work, it's not, ultimately it's not coming out of his brain. It's not coming out of his soul. And uh, that's what you need uh, to, to push another person to their great heights. His, if his, yeah. If his great heights are all about engineering and um, machining, you know, he needs someone like you. I'm, I'm just going to venture to say he needs someone like you to push him there. Oftentimes, you know, we all need someone like that pushing us. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to be a, a, a manager of almost 400 people across the southern half of the United States. And I, it was always important to me to teach somebody to do what I do. But if I didn't know how to do it, I wanted to find the guy who was the very best at that and stay in my lane. I will never call him and say, Hey, yeah. you need to machine this way. And I don't know if you know any machinists. That's a quick way to get in a fist fight is tell a machinist, you need to do it this way. Or what's even more fun, put two machinists in the same room and have them tell each other how to work. That's fun. Oh, that yeah. is an entertaining. <laughs> they, they don't like being told. So, I am so famous for saying, stay in your lane. And I'll stay in my lane. You, but if he has a suggestion, have you thought about 
I'm like, you know, I haven't, but let's make it. Let's try it. So if I say, you know, you're super good at this. If you've had this idea that you've always wanted to do, bring it to me. It's like the guardian that you're talking about. A customer said, I've always thought a blade like this. And we email back and forth, back and forth, back and forth on, no, I want to warn Cliff. And I'm like, well, what about this? And then what if we do this? And what if we do that? And that's how that was born. And I get emails every week from customers say, have you ever thought about like, send it to me. I'm not a diva. I don't think I design everything the best in the world. How, how have you felt uh, market forces on knife trends? Like, um, for instance, I'm a big lover of Pical style knives. Um, I, I just always have been, or I, I should say since they, since the pin, the ditch, cl the, the, um, what is that? The ditch clip, clinch, the ditch, pick? clinch pick. Sorry. <laughs> Ever since that came out, I, I, I've thought it was awesome and they've become very popular. I think a lot of it has to do with people think you don't need any skill to use them. And, yeah. and, and you know, you need less, that's for sure. It relies on your natural arcing motions and and adrenaline dump yeah. caveman style fighting. Um, and, and this is not to belittle anyone who does Libre fighting. I'm not I'm not saying that it doesn't take skill, uh, but it, it has been a very definite uh, trend. Uh, how yeah. do you how do you feel in terms of reacting to those kind of market forces? It's funny. Well, I've I've been so fortunate because I've kind of blazed my own thing to hit those trends right before they become a trend. It's like this is the MR1. So I literally released this blade for pre-sale, I think Wednesday, and it's a Pacal. And this came by way of a Marine Corps unit asking me. Hey, we need this. We can't find it, but I love your Night Stalker grip. Can you help us out? And I built it. And then I was talking to my wife and I said, man, I'm seeing the word Pakal everywhere now. I think I'm going to bring this on as a production blade. And I think the industry is moving towards the fixed blade. I really do. And especially for defensive use. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Okay, so huge huge uh, uh like um population of people who are getting into knives through pocket knives which i absolutely love uh you know the action uh the the look the design the materials um you know people go down the rabbit hole with steels and and all that uh, milling all the things that that uh modern knife companies can do with folders is really bringing people into the fold and and i'm all for that like even if you you're getting your knife as a as a fashion accessory look i'm going to pair this with this shirt and and uh, you know and and this fancy wallet i i love it i love it all i i say more is better uh but yeah, in terms of cool because you know we're humans yeah and humans like different colors and they like different music and uh god made some of us different skin tones and body shapes and I don't care if you don't like the same music I like. I think the music I like is great. If you like a folder, you should like a folder. And I, I, I don't like all this like fighting and oh, oh I just that's not me. So, so I agree totally. So, the, so that trend, you know, these people who are getting really into EDC and the flashlights and stuff, it it all is going towards fixed blades, I believe. Yeah. Um, and and that's because people are discovering, oh, you can have a fixed blade. Uh, that is totally non-combative looking, and it can fit in your front pocket, and uh, and that solves the pocket knife issue. It also solves any sort of if you're someone who's doing work beyond like office work, the kind of stuff I do, and you actually need a fixed blade knife for the strength and the robustness. Well, you can still have it and have it in your pocket. You don't have to wear it just because right. it's fixed blade. Doesn't mean you have to walk around with a with a K bar on your hip. Um, so I I agree with you. I think I think things are going towards. Uh, more and more people getting fixed blades. How do you, uh, how would you, or what models do you have that incorporate that? Because some of your models do appear to be more EDCable, quote unquote. Yeah. So you want to grab that one with a little century? The Piranha, that is how this was born. A million people asked me, I love your fixed blades, but like you, I can't take this to the office, but I still wanted that same amount of grip and the durability from a fixed blade but i want to be able to drop it in my pocket so that's how that was born and we've got something super cool coming out for these that same ring grip that you have on your guardian mm -hmm. 
I've got that sensory grip coming for the piranha. Cool. So you got to listen, and there, I love a fixed blade knife, but I, it's hard to get a little guy to feel like a, a big, and I, these are sold out all the time, all the time. I cannot keep them. You also have the, the nightshade line. Uh, the nightshade line is born with a ring on it, correct? Uh, that's that ring is yes, integral. That was to the, the handle. first, the very first ring handle. That one. Okay. So what's, what? What? Is, I know the nightshade comes in a number of um, uh, blade styles, but what? What is the? Um, what's the guiding force behind that design? So this was the original. Well, this is the more refined original, but this is the reverse Tonto. I had a police officer uh, in Chattanooga, and I won't say his name, but he wanted a get-off-me knife. And he said, I need something small that'll sit right behind my mag well. I love your stuff. And this is when we were still going to the local markets. And, and I mean, beating the street, hitting it hard every weekend, grind all day, <laughs> finish blades all night, go sell them. And we got this small following locally, and then it just – but he wanted – he said, I want something that's front and back, but it's got to be comfortable no matter how I grab it. And I just toiled over it. And he's like, I don't like ring blades. And I made one and I said, I really think you'll like this. And then I showed it to camera wife and she's like, eh, I, you need to be able to just this because I uh, everybody is not trained like you. Everybody doesn't understand this. So maybe you should do this. And I was like, holy crap and i did it and i ended up putting this ring in the line of your knuckles and i showed it to him and he went crazy over it he's like wow that thing is great and it worked so it started this and then people say hey have you ever thought about a clip point on that how about a one clip how about this how about a four inch version of that how about that so they just i try to listen and keep my ear to the ground because i People want different stuff. I think the ergonomics, uh, you, we've been talking a lot about ergonomics. Ergonomics come into play so much with the ring. And the and, and I feel like the ring on a knife has to be so refined. It has to be so well considered. Yes. Because if it if it does misalign your, your you can it really j jack up your hand. You know, it's yes. like knuckle dusters. You know, I have a couple of them and I've, I've hit the heavy bag with them and it hurts like hell if it's not designed it shouldn't correctly. hurt you yeah <laughs> agreed the, you know what the, the only knuckle duster end. that works is this this yeah. old 1918 because hands were smaller than i guess i don't know it fits me perfectly and i could i could go to town all day with that but uh to make it universal you know you really do have to offset the ring it has yeah. to be pushed forward so that your 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 knuckles aren't doing this um so how long did it take you to to really uh zero in on that Man. On the wall in the other shop, there are 10 of these in a row until I get to the one. And then it's funny because we have a little bit of property in my life was walking around the yard. And this happens more often. Um, she's got to have, you know, good things she doesn't carry in the yard. Because I'll come running up with a knife like, look, I did it. And she's like, whoa. And I, I, I give it to her. And that's the final litmus. And she's like, yep. And I'm like, yeah, it fits me too. And then I go find the biggest simian human that i know I'm like put this in your hand and that finger alignment you know as being a martial artist these three fingers are so important for grip so if you're gonna be able to make that fist and get that lock you can't have a fat handle and if you're gonna strike somebody your knuckles need to be in alignment and certainly not get bit by a piece of steel because that crap hurts it really does yep I do the and same thing just, uh, when I get a new knife. I, I bring it to my martial arts class and show it off. And there's uh, a variety of different sizes there. And there's a guy who's yeah. 300 and I don't know, he's gigantic. And and this fits his hand fine. Like with me, when I hold it like this, that choil, uh, it, it's kind of my fingers don't go in there. And I don't try and force it because that's when it's yeah, it hurts. So it's very comfortable like this. And then my my buddy at martial arts, he fills up the whole thing. And, you know, yeah. And it fits him perfectly. I think that's a very difficult thing, not even with a, not even just with a ring knife, but with any grip to get those different hand shapes, different hand sizes uh, to really work. That's why you have to listen. You know, 
you can design the coolest looking thing on paper, but that's why there's so many iterations of, of the design. That's also what's good about owning your own stuff, your own equipment and not having somebody else make your stuff for you. Because if, if I need to make a tweak, it's a matter of minutes, you know, You're right? Hey, let's, we, we got to do this different, yeah. and it, different hands, different people. So you say, listen, and that is really important. That's what um, most knife people really appreciate about most knife companies and especially smaller um, companies and knife makers that are accessible that you can talk to is that is that they take that they take the the uh, the input and and put it into their knives and make changes so that obviously for them it's good they sell more knives but their product also becomes more refined listening also is important in collaborations and i've no i know that you've done yeah. a number of them you were holding up the sapper you did that with imri morgenstern who's a, a an uh, israeli defense force uh, yeah. guy and steve tarani i mean i love steve tarani that's the thing i mean when a guy like steve tarani comes to you and maybe some of our younger guys just getting into the knife industry don't know his name and he goes you're doing stuff that I like. And he hasn't made an knife with anybody since 5'11 in the 90s. Yeah. I mean, a yeah. long time. And you're like, okay. And there's wink, wink, dot, dot, dot. Those uh, those karambits that he was so super famous for. I may know a guy named Tim Kell that's going to be re-releasing those with Steve. Really soon. <laughs> wow. I'm going to have to figure this one out. Give me some time. <laughs> that's yeah. pretty cool. See if you can. Rhymes with Tim Kell. And my help with, uh, <laughs> what, what, if you would, uh, pull one of those Taranis off the wall. Tell me about this design, because I, I must be perfectly honest. It does not look intuitive ergonomically to me. It was not at all what I expected when Steve and I were emailing back and forth. But he does a lot of the CQB CIA training still currently with DevGru and a lot of the other operational forces. Oh, wow. Still every weekend. And he wanted something that mounts on your belt that is low profile inside the waistband. So, and I'm, Dave just got one of these. And a lot of people will say this at first like, I, I didn't understand this. And, I didn't like it at first, and then they, they fall in love with it. So it's got three grips. Your standard forward, and that's just a punch knife, you know, and this is a very thick geometry Was Steve was like, this is what it has to be. The handle's shaped like this. Um, you're going to make the steel magic, and you're going to put your nickel boron coating on there, and um, this is what it's going to look like. And a guy like Steve, you don't really argue with him on that. So... <laughs> The thumb forward is a little more dexterous, and then the finger forward gives you a – it's described as peeling somebody off of you. So when it comes down to using the Tarani close quarter, it may not be your most exciting hour. It's – you know, we're not cleaning game here. This is last ditch. You're trying to create space, get to your secondary – so it's a positive grip and there's nothing extra, nothing more that you need. So that one comes in a variety of blades. I see a Tonto right there. Right. And um, you've got like a, a drop point. Right, that's your Doshi. This is the ridge back because it, it thought it looked like a mountain. Mm -hmm. And then we've got, uh, it's a standard clip. So kind of a drop, but we took a little clip. And then the spear point. And one thing that was very important to these, they had to be really robust. And every, so that the triangle, this is a 90 degree angle. These three screws and these two are always in line with the tip of the blade to put all of that energy that you're pushing through. So the line up here, here, all the way through bone conduction. So you get all of that force that you need to really drive this thing where you're trying to put it. So it's, there's so much strength when you get that bone conduction through here and it all, so that's what that triangle was for. And 
he was very specific about that. And it makes a lot of sense from a combative standpoint, if that's what you, yeah, th- that's what the blade's for. I've, I've had a, um, uh, I, I have one push dagger, sad to say, in my whole collection. And uh, so I'm, I'm seeing a glaring hole in my collection that, that needs to be, fil- and, and this, when this came out, I was like, ah, I don't know. Like, yeah. but, but seeing, and I, I watched Dave's video, of course, and seeing you talk about it like this and, 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 Steve Tarani, obviously, like I didn't have any doubts because you and Steve uh, Tarani were involved, but I didn't know how it would work in my hand. But seeing you talk about that triangle and having it nestle right up into your palm, straight down the wrist, yeah, that makes that makes sense. And um, and okay, so you also worked with this gentleman, uh, Emory Morgenstern, um, an IDF, IDK, IDF guy. IDF. Um, who you know obviously israeli defense force they are constantly working and uh, this is probably someone uh i know he makes his own knives or designs his own knives right tell me about that relationship and and what the collaboration process was to come up That's with an this interesting sapper. story yeah you know, initially we reached out to see if he might like the tcq blades and then that developed a friendship and then th- those guys at tactical riflemen have a tremendously successful training program one they're all tier one guys he was a tier one guy for their counter-terrorist units in israel so the provenance that they bring to the table is pretty substantial and he said you know i've got this blade i used to make for our sapper units and that's there that's a mind searching unit and he said we really loved it but i love your style i've got this blade will you take a look at it and I really loved this collab with Emory because one, we we were fast friends. We're super close now. And I would say, all right, this is what I think. I think we need to do this, 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 and this. And he's like, do it, do it. And he's a knife maker, you know, and he's talented. And what we came up with on this, it, it was just from simple stuff. Like I wanted to back this wedge up a quarter inch to make that tip diamond shaped where it's useful to puncture and lining everything up. The tips are straight in line. This was a true 50, 50 collab. I mean, and neither one of us had an attitude because we both have different backgrounds that we brought to the table. And it is a, it's a special blade. It is a beautiful blade. I love the, the re, I'm a big recurve fan. I also love the uh, look of that tip and the swedge. I couldn't tell from the pictures if the swedge was sharpened or not. Um, you you mentioned an etched line uh, down the center. I uh, like to catch it. I think from the tip to the what's that for? So Emory is the expert on this, but when you're probing for a mine, knowing exactly where this tip is is incredibly important for obvious reasons. Uh, you, you know, a millimeter off, and you're you turn into a pink mist, and that's a really bad thing. So this is to give you exact sight alignment to know exactly where your tip is on your subterraneous so you can feel that and you know exactly where that is because i mean millimeters matter right when you come to that and actually the, the the first run sold out in one day but the secondary run we were talking yesterday we're going to put graduated lines so we're going to have the metric on one side standard on the other because israel so you'll know how deep this thing is. That's the line. It's just stuff like that that we really, and even this hook in the back is not just for retention. It is to grab it. And he's going to do a video soon. Well, I can't even do it right. Oh yeah. So you can feel that in the palm of your hand under the ground and know you get that tactile feedback. So the, the crest of the bird's beak on the back of the pommel there right. is is the center line where that line is etched all the way to the tip. Yeah, that's so all that's, the way re- through. that's really interesting to me. Like, um, yeah, it, it, at being a non sapper, you know, I, I would look at that and wonder, I know there's some purpose to that, but what yeah. is it? And the idea is the tip is under the sand or under whatever the mine right. might be buried in. And you need to know exactly what you're probing with and where it is. That's, that's pretty cool. I mean, I yeah, think that me, knife is it, beautiful. And it, man <laughs> it is it's three sixteenths it's the first recurve i've done and i brought the 
we need to make this tactical and practical. I hate that phrase, but right, it is. Right. So we wanted it bush crafty and useful, not just to search for a mine and what came out of it. I'm going to have this on display at blade show because they sold, I mean, quick and he didn't even have an opportunity to push those out to his followers. Oh. I put them to my guys on Patreon and I put them to my community and they were gone gone and it's i like it a lot. yeah that's uh that's a good problem to have um not for my end because it's going to be a while till i get one but that's a great <laughs> problem to have as a as a knife company and and speaking of being a knife company which you are how do you hope to see tkel knives grow what what is your what is your goal i'm, I'm kind of known for saying this and it's I want to make as many knives as I possibly can at or above my current quality level. So I don't really know what that number looks like. I, I don't think that to me, in my mind's eye, that's not multi-million dollars. I, I, I cannot physically sharpen and make hmm. that many blades myself. And if it's got my name on it, I touch it. My wife ships it. The guy, the one dude that I trust puts the screws in it and reads the order and makes sure everything's in the box and packs those up. But whatever that size is, that's what we want to do. As for us, it's we sell into a lot of the three letter agencies and a lot of military, and we don't have any military contracts. We've done big runs. Uh, for me, it, several of those agencies, and we get the feedback of, man, I use this to do blank, and it saved my life. That means more to the people in this room than how many blades or how big the company gets, because I have no idea. I mean, six was enough for me at one point, a and then it was 12, and then it was 20, and then it was, man. And we've really, the way we make them, and how we're able to make so many in, in a week's time period with just me and a handful of people is different because I wanted to make more, but I didn't want to make more at the sacrifice of, well, anything. So any step we take, it's painstaking because I'm like, it, it's got to be better. So that customer feedback, I mean, it, I feel it like if somebody's like, you know, you missed. And fortunately, we don't get those emails very often. I mean, it's very rare and it's, it's usually not the case, but I feel it. Like It's like, okay, you know, I've got to do this different. So let's change this. But as long as it fits within, I may sound like a control freak, <laughs> maybe what it is, but it's, it's really important. No, it sounds to me like you want to always maintain the personal connection, yeah, yeah. not just you with the knives, but the knives with your with your customers. I mean, I I, I get I, when I'm texting you or anybody else, and I'm not answering fast enough. I have to send them a picture. I'm in my full hood. I sharpen 50, 60, 70 blades a day before the sun ever comes up. <laughs> I mean, I've tried to train somebody to sharpen knives. They, it's just not how I want it done. So until I can figure out myself personally how to sharpen more, that's how many I'm going to make because oh, man. we do it different. You know, yeah. even my sharpener is so weird <laughs> because nobody said, this is how I sharpen. I did ask them, by the way. And like, well, most guys don't want to be like, okay, I'll figure it out. So now I have custom stuff made for that too. It's, it's crazy. So it's, <laughs> It's stressful though, man. I mean, it really is. It is. Sleep is something that is in short supply at our house. But I wake up naturally like a freak of nature at four o'clock in the morning. I love it. I love it because you have a, a pretty broad catalog um, and you've figured out certain ways to automate your process, but they all maintain that personal connection and they all have your hand uh, not just in the design and the painstaking design and iteration, reiteration, but in the sharpening, you know, the, 
I'll, I'll just close with this. This guardian edge I've looked for. I've looked for uh, any sort of inconsistency, just not not to call anyone out or anything. But I always do that just because there's something so gratifying at looking at a perfect edge. And this is I cannot. And you've got three. You've got six of them on this because it's a That's triple so edge. Hard, Bob. You don't even <laughs> understand. It looks easy. That hard. That, it doesn't. Hard. It doesn't look easy. But it looks like um, you know it. It's it's perfect. So. I love this. I, I really uh, I've appreciated talking with you and and learning more about your process. It, it it actually makes the knives even more appealing at this point, because I know that each one has uh, such a personal connection well, to you. It. you know, it means a lot to everybody here. I mean, that's it. I mean, I'm the breadwinner, so it means a lot. Well, Tim, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been great speaking with you. I really love it. And I urge people to, uh, if they haven't already, which I'm sure they have, but to check out your YouTube and your Instagram and to seek you out at Blade Show. Seek out your table at Blade Show. And yeah, we're uh, going to be in the big room. At the big <laughs> room. We right. made it. <laughs> right on. You're three, right? <laughs> oh, man. Well, I, I will be there and I uh, can't wait to shake your hand. Yes, sir. We'll see you then. All right. Take care. Yeah. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Tim Kell of T. Kell Knives. Uh, the man, uh, I just love the honesty in, that goes into the designs and then the, the integrity that goes into the making of these, of these beautiful creations. And now having one just doesn't feel like enough, but that's me. That's my problem. My issue, as you know, uh, you know, Junkie is is not an accidental name. Uh, be sure to join us next week for another great interview and uh, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. And of course, Thursday Night Knives, when the weekend begins. That's what I've been hearing. So I, I'm going to go with that. Uh, Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.